Hi, Richard. I'm just uh, waiting for your video to come through. That's good. Can you see us? You can see some of us there. I can. Okay. And okay, you've already got your slides up. Richard, I'll just let you get on with that now. Sounds good. Okay. So I, I'm from MarketPsych, and uh, just to give you guys some background, MarketPsych is a company that has been doing social media analytics for about uh, since 2004, so about nine years now. And our original goal was to find strategies that we could trade in the financial markets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about trading in the markets and also about what kind of data we can pull out of social media and uh, what we can do with it. But first, what is the angriest month? So what do you think? What is the angriest month? January. 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 <laughs> January. A lot of people say January. That's funny. Um, in the United States, they say April. That's when our taxes are due. <laughs> but actually, it's uh, September. And when you think about it, and when I take a little more background, it makes sense. This is the sentiment of anger for investors in the uh, major U.S. stock ex uh, exchange, the S&P 500. So people talking about those companies and talking about the U.S. stock markets tend to be the angriest in September. Now, what is the happiest month, do you think? <laughs> You Eddie, you could uh, communicate it. December. December, yeah. December, yeah, we're saying December. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. This data was not controlled for uh, people's references to Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas. Um, when we control for that, it's actually, uh, it's actually May. But when you allow through all of the happy expressions and joy, uh, it turns out December. So uh, I just want to tell you, this is as good as it gets. So enjoy it. <laughs> it's all downhill from here, guys. So who are, who's Market Psych? Well, I explained a little bit. Um, basically, we've been downloading uh, social media and looking at different types of sentiments, emotional sentiments, macroeconomic uh, factors, even sentiments about topics, like how do people feel about their government, for example. We can measure that in social media. And we've been doing this, again, for trading purposes, uh, but we started to expand out into much broader area, including risk management and uh, economic forecasting. And this actually came out of research uh, in neuroeconomics. Uh, it turns out I was a quantitative trader in college, or after college as well. And then uh, after the university and doing the trading for a couple of years, I went on to medical school and became a psychiatrist. And while uh, doing my psychiatry uh, residency, I did a postdoc in neuroeconomics at Stanford, and what we did there was we were, of course, this is when Google was going public, and a lot of people were talking about the web. So we became very interested in, can we extract factors in people's conversations on the web, uh, specific sentiments, and use those to predict uh, future price behavior or other factors. The good thing with the financial markets is you've got so much evidence of behavior. Uh, you do that on the web as well. You've got clicks and purchases. But back then, that wasn't all available like it is now. Back then, what we did have, though, was the movement of stocks. And we could look at how people talked about stocks and companies and then look at their, their prices and see uh, which sentiments move the prices. And so we actually set up a hedge fund. And we launched it on September 2nd of 2008. And for those of you familiar with the financial crisis, that was the first week of the financial crisis. Sure enough, um, the fund didn't do well at first, but it actually recovered quite well, especially with the fear uh, we had a lot of fear signals that were very good for us. Uh, so while the blue line, which is the U.S. stock market, fell a lot, uh, we were a market neutral fund and we actually did very well. And um, ultimately we closed the fund because after a long period like this, uh, you can't keep your investors. <laughs> so we, we closed our fund and we had run out of money, you know, a lot of issues with being a startup that's running a hedge fund. Um, it's, it's hard to raise capital. Many of you who have startups understand the uh, that raising capital itself is a full-time job, much less uh, running a hedge fund and a technology company. So uh, what we did then was we spun off um, we spun off our data business so that it could actually start, uh, well, we spun it off so that we could have the financing for the technology side. And so we've run a, a partnership with Thomson Reuters for over a year now, and we've produced new data that uh, is what I'll show you uh, in partnership with Thomson Reuters. And I believe that uh, James Contarella from Thomson Reuters is in the audience. James, can you raise your hand if you're out there? 
<laughs> let's, let's just move that. Where are you, James? I'm over here. Hey, James. And this is the product that we created with Thomson Reuters. And James uh, is speaking after me. He's not going to touch on this uh, in too much detail. Uh, the premise being that where there's emotions, there's cycles. And that's what we'll get into now very quickly. So as I said, we're analyzing a lot of content. We're currently, as you know, Twitter produces about 380 million tweets a day. We're not doing much with Twitter. We get about 20,000 a day from, from Twitter um, because we're looking for very specific types of tweets. So we, we filter it out. Um, we're getting a lot of blogs and we're getting a lot of news and we get about 2 million articles a day when it, it comes down to that. And these are relevant articles. We're filtering out uh, a lot of non-relevant content uh, just because of the sheer size. And we're producing a lot of data out of this. Um, we actually have, this says 1,600. We've actually produced over 3,000 uh, specific sentiments and topics now uh, in our internal feeds. So it's very complex. And the interesting thing, and what I'll show you that I think is fairly cool, is that we're not going to track countries and locations, commodities, currencies, uh, sentiments, and industries around the world. And here's an example of what we're able to track when you are uh, doing linguistic or textual analysis on this type of a pipeline. You can see things like, um, obviously, sentiment, but fear, joy, optimism, and also macroeconomic factors. If you think about it, people speak about uh, credit conditions in very systematic ways. Also, things like consumer sentiment or uh, whether the government is unstable or fiscal policy. All of these can actually be measured in a fairly systematic way. So that's what we've been uh, working on and now are, are producing. Here's a number of the countries that we're doing this for. There's 120 countries that we're tracking, everything from Bahrain down to Zimbabwe. And the good thing about these sentiments that we're tracking is they're, they're internally consistent. So for example, uh, hate, as you would expect, is correlated inversely uh, with trust. If you, if you hate something, you're not as likely to trust it. So we find that there's an internal logic to this data, which gives us a lot of confidence, obviously, in how it works. And we also see that it confirms our experience of reality. So this is global uh, economic optimism around the world in the first half of 2012. And it's extracted from social media, so blogs, uh, financial message boards, and Twitter. And what you see here are things like Peru and uh, Uruguay being very positive, Ghana, Philippines, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and of course the Baltic states, all of which sort of confirms. Uh, our experience isn't, you know, Greece being the, uh, the very pale green, which means it's the most pessimistic. The white countries have no, we have no data for. Um, or we do actually have the data, but we're not selling it because it's uh, not of interest to most people, unfortunately. But interestingly, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of data about the world and it, it meshes with our reality. Here's Egypt, I'll give you another example. Um, what we saw in Egypt was a large uh, decline in trust. This is significant based on its historical movements. Big decline in trust before the revolution began. And when we, what we, when we looked back at this, we found that there was a, there were reports of government corruption that were coming out in the news media, and these filtered into the social media. And there were people had lost trust in the government. We saw a little little blip in this variable called regime change. Much more anger. People were very angry. And they started saying, we've got to make reforms and changes to our government. Um, so they protested. And what happened here was the violence against the protesters. And I would put to you that Mubarak had a chance to stay in power with some significant reforms until the violence happened. Once the violence happened, that's when people said, we've had enough. It's time for regime change. Mubarak himself was ousted about approximately here in February. So. You can actually track events over time, and, and what we like to argue is that sentiments tend to precede actions, and that's the key. Here's another example. Uh, in the United States, there was a major drought this summer. Corn, soybeans, agricultural commodities were impacted, and the prices rose dramatically. This is corn. At the top, the top line of yellow is the corn price. Down here, what we see is uh, fear. So what you have in the United States is you have satellite-guided tractors, combines, um, covering huge fields of thousands of uh, acres or, uh, in size. And what they're doing, uh, because they often don't even have to drive these tractors, they're, they're on an autopilot, they're tweeting with their friends. And they're saying things like, hey, buddy, uh, corn's looking a little weak. I'm a bit worried about the weather. Um, you know, when are we going to get some rain? This is concerning. They're making these comments. We're actually able to pick these up, especially when they filter up into blogs about the, the agricultural crops. 
So we saw fear from the farmers about the weather conditions. Then what we saw as well is people started reporting actual weather damage. So we see with our data that you know, what people are saying is filtering through and it does appear to predict price action as well. Here's another example of a, a variable that we call uh, the market risk index or the bubbleometer. And it's essentially a measure of short-term speculative enthusiasm. And when you see that the short-term enthusiasm is dropping, it actually pre appears to precede uh, a market price action. And this is in a longer cycle. So this is from 1998 up to 2012. It's a long period of time. And interestingly, you would have been out of the major crashes in the market and caught the major rallies if you had watched the speculative activity and looked at the short term dropping under the long term. So what are some secrets of sentiment data? I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, essentially, what we find is that each sector has its own sentiment that is, that is predictive in its own way. So people talk about mining differently than biotechnology and, and different than uh, waste management. All of them are very different. And so you've got to understand the sentiment to, to use them for prediction. We also find that social media forecasters themselves have inverse skill. That is when people uh, on social media all agree that the price is going in one direction, it's actually going in the opposite direction. And I'll, I'll show you some of these examples. This is a, a color-coded chart. There's red, green, and blue. Now the red is one particular sector. The blue is another, and the green is another. And the scatter plot shows how people are talking about the fundamental strength and versus how they're talking about the stock price, whether they think the price is going up. So the blue, how people think, is, is in the dumps. This is 2011. One of these is airlines, one of these is energy, and one of them is technology. And I won't get into um, any interaction about this, but it's interesting here. People think that the price of the red sector is going up. So did people like in 2011 technology, energy, airlines? You know, what do you think? Turns out they liked energy, and we tracked it pretty well. Um, they kind of liked technology. They did not like airlines in 2011. And sure enough, here's the price movement. It, interestingly, they, they began to separate and, and actually showed some characteristics you would expect. Now, here's another example of uh, using social media data. This is, we had a Fortune 100 company approach us and ask us, uh, can you predict whether somebody in our company is leaking insider information? Because we think that somebody in our company is manipulating our stock price by releasing information in advance of, for example, earnings conference calls. And so we looked at, uh, we, we actually asked them, we said, what do you think people are, are leaking? What kind of information? And they said, well, we can't tell you but you need to figure it out. So we thought, hmm, okay, what are we gonna look at? So we said, we'll look at all the predictions of the stock price going up or going down. And over five years, we looked at 2 million social media messages and we found 14,000 specific predictions of the stock price in those messages. And we found that there were uh, the top 10 users, for example, would make 50 predictions. And a lot of people made only one prediction or two or three. What we found, um, well, let me ask you to guess. <laughs> Do you think that the people, I already told you they're not accurate, but what percentage of, of, their, of their predictions of the stock going up or down, what percentage are correct? Any, any ideas? 50, 50 70. Yeah. 70. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're wrong 60% of the time. So people are wrong 60% of the time. Actually, a great trading signal uh, if you can find if you find this systematically. People on social media are consistently wrong, and you know those of us who, if you've tried to be an individual investor and you thought, "Wow, Apple's at seven hundred dollars. I've got to get more Apple stock," or something like that, um, that's pretty characteristic of individual investors who who talk on social media, because Apple's now under six hundred dollars. Um, Here's another example from earnings conference calls. So I talked about social media, but there's other sources, obviously news, and there's earnings conference calls uh, for companies. What The point of this sort of psychedelic graph, and I don't expect you to understand it, but the point of this is that each company has a color, and each company clusters in how they communicate with investors. You can actually see that um, this company, IBM, is the orange company. IBM speaks about their company at their conference calls in the same way almost every time. 
They, they use the same amount of bullishness. Yeah, things are great. We're going to do. Um, and they don't use much possibility. That is, they don't talk about the future. But other companies like this red company, or this blue company, and the red one is uh, Dell, and the blue one is Cisco, they talk a lot about future possibilities. Unfortunately, they haven't done too well either over the period of this study. But it, it's interesting because it gives you a sense of what companies, how they cluster in their communications. And here's one that's uh, going to be personally familiar to you in the UK. Uh, we looked at trust levels of banks, and we saw that Barclays, for the last year or so, was considered the most trusted bank of the major banks uh, that we measured. And what we saw here, of course, was the LIBOR fixing scandal. And as soon as that broke, people started to uh, to trust Barclays a lot left. Things got really bad uh, when they lost the CEO. So what you see here is Barclays, within a very short period of time, went from the most trusted to the least trusted bank. And if you're a bank, you really care whether people trust you or not. Uh, it makes a big difference. So what's interesting as well with Barclays is they were the ones that came forward about something that all the other banks were doing. But they were the most open and transparent about it. And so what it tells you in terms of reputation management uh, is unfortunately, you know, being upfront can sometimes be a uh, backfire as well. We talked about global uh, or country data, like economic optimism. It turns out that when you use a number of these variables together, sentiments do in fact, this is a, a chart of the, the, the 20, uh, countries with the highest economic activity. And we have found that we can actually tap into this pipeline information and we can predict uh, essentially on a minutely basis based on the news flow, how the economies are doing around the world and what's going to happen next. Um, not so much you know, that we predict that I should say, but we can keep track of economic activity and it actually um, is predictive of say uh, quarterly GDP numbers uh, because we already know what happened in the news flow. So then we can set, we can pretty much tell you where the GDP has gone. So it's fairly interesting using tapping into this big flow of information of this pipeline. If you interpret it correctly, you can uh, derive useful predictions. So in conclusion, um, as you all know, who've worked with this, sentiment data is very challenging to extract. But if you do a good job out of, of it and you work at it a long time, it actually can be predictive of economic activity, of prices, of volatility. And the way to understand the data is, is spend a lot of time with it and understand how people communicate, how they talk, and uh, keep in mind that being flexible is key. We know a lot of people who've taken sentiment data without understanding uh, how people you know, communicate with sentiment, and they aren't able to find any predictive value in sentiment. But if you, if you understand more about how people react to information, process information, it actually can become very useful data. So just so you're aware, we have a, a free weekly to monthly newsletter. Uh, we'd love to get you on the newsletter list. James uh, Contarello will accept your business cards <laughs> to get on the newsletter list. It's, it's free. It just kind of keeps, uh, keeps you aware of what the advances in sentiment are uh, that we've been working on. And um, this is our team who, of course, make it all possible. I'd love to hear from you guys, though. Uh, what questions do you have about um, what I've went through with lightning speed? OK, Richard, thank you very much. Let's take some questions. Here's a question for Richard. Oh, here we go. Richard, hi. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting what you discussed about uh, just now. I have, I think, one question, maybe two questions. Uh, with regard to the slides you showed us, one of the slides was showing five secrets revealed. Uh, Sorry, one of the slides showed what? One of the slides showed five secrets of social media or sentiment. Yeah. And actually, there were only four of them on the slide. What is the fifth one? <laughs> That's the ultimate secret. I had to, I had to delete it. I'm sorry. No, um, you're right. What was it? Um, good question. I'll, I'll let you know. So I need to sign up to your letter, right? <laughs> yeah. no, I'm afraid that's, 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 that's the fifth one. Uh, it's, yeah, I'm afraid I can't, I can't disclose. Okay. I'll fall through a trap door if I, if I tell you. Okay, and actually another slide showed the analysis you've done on Egypt. <clears throat> uh, yes. To my mind, it looks a little bit like Fibonacci cycle so analysis like when you have 
the, the whole period of the, like if you can look at the time series, like from the beginning to the end, you can say that stock price is moving up or down and then you can do this, all this Fibonacci stuff and crazy stuff and analysis. And basically to me it looks a little bit the same because definitely you would assume as the psychologist that basically initially you would have some negativity in the media and then you would have some other flow and then you would have some other flow and then it would result in changing the government. So if, you, if I take this example to Syria, I would see all the things which are happening at the moment, but it doesn't lead to the change in the government. So yeah. what is the practical applicability of this analysis, if you will? Well, it's, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that I can predict a revolution. That's, that's one thing. Um, what we do think is that because we don't have enough samples, we can't do an event study on this, so I can't I can't do an event study and tell you you know given um, th these 100 revolutions here's the pattern that seems to happen every time uh, we have well, we've looked at Syria as well we also saw a decrease in trust in social media interestingly we we did not see it in the news which was the same with Egypt we didn't see a big decline in the news um, so I apologize that my screen is uh, flipping out a bit but so. <coughs> Yeah, it's a fair it's a fair point. I mean, we just don't have enough samples uh, to know if we can predict it, and so we cherry picked it because we thought it was interesting. So it's a, it's a frustration. Maybe there's something there. Okay, thank you. Okay, very much. thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering if, depending on the source um, that you analyze, so blogs versus Twitter versus any other source that you use, there's a difference in the sentiment and if you adjust it in any sort of way? There is a big difference in the sentiment. Um, we do adjust by the type of user. So uh, for example, we have uh, investment blogs, and then you have say technology blogs. And the technology blogs are talking about products and the investment blogs are talking about the stocks and uh, the investment potential of the company. Very different. So we, we separate them out and, and categorize them differently. Um, that's with uh, stocks and equities. When you look at countries, then it's, it's another story. Then you've got people talking about vacations, you know, going to Egypt for vacation. You know, oh, it's a great deal right now. You should go to Egypt uh, versus people saying, wow, the political situation is very unstable. It's dangerous. Um, so you have to look at what, uh, what exactly people's uh, point of view is. And you have to essentially uh, screen on a, very, on a micro level uh, from the thousands of blogs that are there. So always yeah. depending on the goal that you have out of the analysis, you're gonna adjust in different ways and like screen it in different ways. That's right. So for example, our, our current social media feed is only social, uh, is only investor communities for equities, but for currencies and commodities and countries, uh, we do a much broader range. So any, any reference to the, the country, the commodity or the currency, as long as it's in an investment, you know, the financial context. Hi, uh, I want to understand like uh, from this data, like you're using data from the past and you can see rest retrospectively like this, this were the trends, but how you can use that for the future investments? Well, we, we do statistical analysis, we back, we back test it. So we look at what patterns in the past led to uh, stock price outperformance in the future, you know, uh, previously. So we go back over the 14 years of our data set and we, we do machine learning on it and we identify the patterns that are predictive. And then we do a lot of out of sample tests. We do three out of sample tests uh, to verify what we've found. And we do them in various ways, cross-sectionally by time, uh, also cross-sectionally by uh, ticker or entity. And then we uh, do a, also in forward in time and then we have a human look at them and make sure they make sense. So there's a lot of supervision that goes into it, but um, with the appropriate supervision and with enough experience, it, it works out. It's not simple though. It's not something that you could just plug in and uh, suddenly say, oh, I can predict the stock market. It doesn't, it's not at all like that. Do you start your analysis actually with a hypothesis on what could be a market moving element or do you start with mining the data for patterns which look interesting? We've done both. Uh, we've done both and both are successful um, in general. Uh, the, the challenge with the hypotheses you find is there's so many interesting ones that um, you have to be very careful because many of them don't pan out. Um, so, for example, uh, during the financial crisis, someone said to me, well, let's, 
find all the mentions of mortgages and every every everywhere people are complaining about mortgages will short those banks. But we looked at in history and we found that mortgages actually more mentions before 2007 the stock prices of banks went up if there were more mentions of mortgages. And then when they were doing more then it was bad for a couple of years and then in 2010 the more mortgages mentioned at a bank the better the stock price did. So it reversed three times. Um, so that's a topic, that's not a pure sentiment, but you've got to be careful um, about your hypothesis. And, and with the data mining, uh, you have to be even more careful. So you have to be very systematic and you've really got to understand how you're going to, uh, how, with what kind of parameters you're going to allow your machines to learn patterns. Uh, that's a whole long, you know, days of conversation about that. But it's, it's yeah, it's extensive. So, um... How do we, uh, you mentioned 14 years of history for backtesting? Um, how can you extract such data over such a long period of time uh, reliably? Well, some we've got a couple of advantages. One is a prior company that used to do uh, scraping of the web gave us some of their archives. We also have information from uh, our own crawlers, different places store information. Uh, different companies have stored information and you can retrieve it on the web. Uh, there is survivorship bias, so sometimes companies go bankrupt and their information is lost, but sometimes it's not. And so, you, again, it's I've been doing this for nine years. It takes a long time. <laughs> but you can find a lot of this information in uh, different places. Hi, is all the data aggregated or could you look at individual data and perhaps use it for credit scoring? or something like that, question one. And question two, uh, what's the end game for you? Are you one day gonna uh, lease this out and at some point when it's perfect, make a ton of money <laughs> uh, and invest yourself? Are you building another hedge fund? Well, we used to think, so to, to answer question two, or the, the sexier question, um, we used to think, yeah, that we'd make a ton of money, but now we're, we do it because um, we love it and it's really interesting and uh, the, the deeper we get into it, the more interesting it becomes. Um, and you know, with question, what was question one again exactly? Could you use individual data for credit scoring and just basically making people credit worthy, perhaps? Uh, well, oh, oh, I think you were you asked about article scoring, right? And we do we do that for quality assurance. So we do a lot of article scoring. And we compare articles to events and things like that, make sure that we're scoring them correctly. No, sorry. What I mean is, uh, for example, if someone in retail banking or payday loans, if someone were to take out a loan, that you look at their feeds on social media and you can predict whether they're losing a job or not so that uh, perhaps less bankable people can become bankable because there's more information available. That makes sense. I, th that can definitely be done. I mean, there are, I think... We're, you're all at the conference uh, because there's so many things to do uh, in this area and very few big companies are able to move fast enough. They don't understand it or they don't have the incentives to pursue what's possible. But it's unbelievable how much we can do with this information. It's amazing to me. Uh, hi there. Um, I was wondering uh, what your revenue model is. It wasn't really clear to me. Uh, how do you monetize your idea? On one hand, and what what kind of clients you've had so far, and that's one question. And second, uh, a bit unrelated, uh, to my understanding, sentiment trading hasn't been successful so far. Um, do you share this opinion, or uh, can you repeat the last sentiment? Sentiment trading, so trading on on indices such a, such as yours, hasn't okay. produced positive results so far in hedge fund activity. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So our original plan was to be a hedge fund, and you know we ran a hedge fund, and we, we did beat the stock market by 24%. So we were the first social media-based hedge fund, uh, which is probably why uh, I'm speaking at the conference. So we did this first. We did it the longest. We had the longest track record. Um, we we outperformed by, like I said, 24%. The S&P 500. We were up 27% over a couple of years. Um, we've got so in our track records audited. Um, so it, it does work for making money, but the amount of money we made wasn't enough to get people really excited, especially when we had a long flat down period. So as a business, um, you know, trading, yeah, it works, um, but can, does it work enough to run a hedge fund? You really need 30 to 40% annual returns 
you're going to start a small hedge fund, and you need to be consistent and have low volatility. Uh, does it work for that? You know, we ran forward our hedge fund strategies since we turned off the fund, and they do earn 30% a year, especially in the last couple of years. We had improved them before we turned off the fund, but we never got to deploy them. When we look at how they do, they do very well. We just we found that it's, it's very challenging to raise the capital. So to speak to your revenue model, we, you know, again, you can be the guy, the gold miner, who goes and tries to find the gold, which we did, uh, or you can be the guy who sells the shovels as well. So what we find is, first, we started, our revenue model was, we'll just sell the shovels, like Thomson Reuters does. So we work with Thomson Reuters because we don't have our own sales team. So our revenue model is based on Thomson Reuters and us selling the data together. Um, the second, though, is this data, we find that a lot of people can't consume raw numbers. They don't know what to do with it. So we produce research based on that data, like the economic uh, forecast that I showed you. There's a lot of people, obviously, around the world who want to know what's happening to the economy day by day or minute by minute. So that in itself, that research can be quite valuable as well. Um, and again, so we have to distribute that, though. And so Thomson Reuters is a great partner for us because they've got an enormous sales force and an ability to distribute uh, widely through 200,000 terminals, et cetera, which is obviously something that would take us years to build ourselves. I think, to be honest, my question was largely covered by you explaining your um, performance um, of the, the fund. You said it, you know, it worked, but it didn't work as well as you, was ho you were hoping to. And my understanding, perhaps you just want to clarify, is that you're now perhaps concentrating more on facilitating other people's use of the, so, of the sentiment data and social media data rather than actually looking to trade it yourself, which I guess is a different skill set because if it's an input, then it, it becomes a, a different way of working, right? It's, yeah, it's a different skill set. You're right. Um, it's, it's challenging. I mean, when you're a, a trader, you're, you know, you think about the markets one way, but when you, you know, I, I have to tell you, like every time that I'm trying to sell my data to someone else, it's not easy. I mean, it's, uh, it's a little painful because <laughs> I'm giving away, you know, what I've worked eight years on and I built for trading. But at the same time, I, I gave it a shot. You know, we, we tried it and as a business, it was very challenging. Um, you can have great returns, and I've known hedge fund managers who had great returns for long periods of time, but they couldn't raise capital because their ideas were, were not easily explainable or the people who had the assets to invest didn't believe them or whatever it was. In our case, it was a difficult time, very little liquidity. And, um, and like you said now, you know, it's interesting with the, the Twitter fund, for example, a lot of bad press ab about that fund, and you know, they're selling some kind of research product now. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of challenges in this space. But, you know, we've been doing it for nine years. We're, we're one of the oldest, I think maybe the oldest company that's still living and that's been doing it. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we do it because we love what we're doing. And we found the truth is there's so much value in this data. As we've been distributing it to other companies and researchers, they are teaching us about the data as well. They're giving us new insights. And so it's become this massive collaboration about how do we extract value from this data. And that, to me, is fascinating. I just talked to university researchers. I uh, just got off the phone like 15 minutes before I'm talking to you, uh, talking to them about their volatility forecasts. Uh, just, you know, really interesting things happening. It's a lot, a lot of fun. Okay, Richard, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. There's a couple more questions, but I think if you send me the link, people can get in touch with you. Can I just say thank you very much for, for presenting and taking the time to come to us from New York. Thank you very much. Thank you.